Okay, hi there. Here's the fourth in our series of five videos looking at key stats on the UK economy ahead of your 2022 economics exams. Let's spend a few minutes thinking about some key numbers on interest rates and credit. Well, the obvious interest rate to start with is the Bank of England's policy interest rate, the base rate or bank rate. Currently 0.5%, but expected to rise. So the Bank of England has been moving on interest rates. It's moved a couple of times. Clearly, they cut them to 0.1% during the pandemic. March the 19th was a key date there. They stayed at that level effectively for over two, or nearly two years. They're now back to 0.5%. But of course, with inflation at 5.5% and expected to rise sharply, the big question to follow in the news is the extent to which the Bank of England is willing and able to move further to raise interest rates, perhaps to help uh, control inflation. So will they be 1% by the end of the year or perhaps even higher, as, as high as 1.5% or 2%? Uh, base interest rates currently 0.5%, but one to watch. What about the cost of a, a home loan? Well, mortgage interest rates, the interest rate you pay on a home loan, uh, they remain fairly low. Uh, here's the data. Uh, you can get a fixed rate of interest, a three-year fix, a uh, pretty low rate, actually, at something like 1.5%. Uh, uh, you can get a two-year fix at about uh, 2%. Uh, the variable rate, of course, rises and falls with, uh, with base interest rates. But again, you can get a mortgage for about 2 2.5% if you can afford one. The big question is not really the interest rate on a mortgage. The key issue is whether you can actually afford to get such a loan. Because, of course, house prices relative to incomes have risen sharply, and that's made housing unaffordable for millions of people. Now, the Bank of England, uh, of course, can use interest rates to influence aggregate demand and inflationary pressure. They can also use quantitative easing, the uh, the process by which the Bank of England creates new deposits, buys bonds, nearly always off the bank uh, off government to inject cash into the banking system. The scale of quantitative easing is huge. This chart shows it. Uh, it hasn't changed since November 2020. So the the stat I would take into the exam is that the total value of quantitative easing in the UK is just a shade under 900 billion pounds. So bond purchases on an enormous scale. That is likely to fall. The Bank of England is looking to start reining in the scale of quantitative easing. Uh, so that figure is likely to fall. So this period of time since uh, 2009, in fact, when the Bank of England first started uh, this process of quantitative easing, may well be starting to come to an end. But definitely one to watch. What about house prices? Well, Average house prices in the UK rose by 10% in 2021. So the, the UK economy, of course, was recovering a little bit from the pandemic, uh, but the price of housing, the average price of property, increased by 10%. Here's the Halifax house price measure. And indeed, the new figure uh, to take into the exam is the average house prices are now over £270,000. Big variations, of course, across the country, but average house prices £270, 270,000 pounds, if only. And of course, another year of house price inflation could easily take it closer towards 300,000 pounds. Now, there's a big debate in economics, of course. You may well have covered this in your lessons as, as to the benefits and the costs, the drawbacks of rising house prices. But the figure is now over 270,000 pounds average. What about debt? We know the government is in debt and the national debt is over two trillion pounds. Well, the national debt, of course, refers to government borrowing and debt. Household debt is also now over two trillion pounds, including uh, 220 billion pounds of consumer credit that's left to be repaid. So here's the chart for household debt. It climbed above uh, £2 trillion in 2021. My, my chart only goes up to 2020, but it, believe me, it climbed above £2 trillion. And this is interesting. This chart shows the debt-to-income ratio in the UK. Very, very high just before the financial crisis. There was a huge surge in the household debt-to-income ratio, a credit boom uh, around the turn of the millennium. That then fell back quite a bit. Lots of households trying to repay some of their debt 
stabilised at about 125% of, of, of income. It's now starting to climb again. I guess the point I want to make here is that there is a lot of household debt, uh, car loans, uh, credit cards, obviously mortgages, and small increases in interest rates on that debt can have a powerful, significant effect on people's spending power, their so-called effective disposable income. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention was that something quite remarkable happened to the household savings ratio during the pandemic. The savings ratio is the percentage of your uh, disposable income uh, that, you, that you have left to save. In other words, what people, the savings that people build up out of their current income, if you like. And look what happened to the savings ratio during the pandemic. It's relatively stable at between 5 and 10% of GDP. It fell during the credit boom. But during the pandemic, the savings ratio shot up to over 25% of disposable incomes. Clearly, people were cutting back on their spending. There weren't the opportunities to go out and spend and travel and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's a huge increase in the, uh, the level of saving. Now, that's fallen back quite a bit since, but remains high. So this is a big issue, the extent to which households have savings, which they might be able to use as a buffer if living costs go up, for example, uh, and the economy suffers a, a, a fresh downturn. But of course, the savings that you have depend on the income that you have. And many low income households have very limited savings indeed. And therefore, they are exposed to increases in things like energy bills and increases in fuel prices and so on. In our final video, I'm just going to choose one or two other key indicators that I think are quite useful to know ahead of your papers.